hope I can talk. <laughs> Turns out I have a uh, strep. What is a strep throat? A strep? Strep. Here's your swallow, but uh, man, does that ever kick the crap out of you? Feels like your whole body's crumbling up and dying. It's a frustrating feeling. Real frustrating feeling. I mean, I think it's early, it's like six in the morning or something. And Sarah says I gotta go to the doctor and get some antibiotics or something. What a pain in the butt. But anyway, she finally got home yesterday. This is how bad it was yesterday. I was right out to lunch for the past two days. I didn't even let the chickens out of the coop all day in that heat. Didn't even think. Don't even remember. She goes, you don't let the chickens out. I'm like, what? What do you mean? <clears throat> I go, what time did you leave yesterday? She goes, I've been gone for two days. I go, shit, bro. Just a mess. It's a nasty thing. I remember having one as a kid. Really, really took me down. But anyway, um, she, um, she got a whole bunch of new stuff done. She designed and made a, picked out a whole pile of new hats. And I think she made, uh, she also showed me a bunch of cool t-shirts for ladies. And, um, Anyway, she's really, she came home totally, totally excited. She hasn't done much with the store for a while. It's her store. It's got nothing to do with me. I just show, I'm the messenger. But anyways, check this out. Um, here's my new favorite. I'm wearing the new favorite and I just stole it. Should probably steal it back, but who these suckers. This is pretty cool stuff. Anyways, she'll, she'll probably be, uh, I think she's gonna have them loaded up on the store. She had to load it up on the, reload it on the store here pretty quick today. And what she does is she only buys so much at a time. Like there's no accounts or anything. She pays with her own money. <laughs> and I guess she gets nervous. She doesn't know if people like it or not. And uh, so, so it's uh, a lot of people don't get their, don't manage to get items from the store. That's a white one. That's a cool one right there. I like that one too. I like them all actually. Just in time for hunting season, all those other camo ones, right? There's a pink one for the lady she made. She's pretty excited. So anyways, I don't know how many flavors there are. So eight or nine new flavors of hats. She's got a bunch of shirts. She'll put them up on the store. I'll put the link to the store up. But I don't think she'll get that store loaded until later today. I wouldn't guess. I would imagine anyway. Oh man, brought her niece home. So we're back to chaos. <laughs> little kid running around. She's in the pool until it almost got dark last night. Of course, Ruby's out there with her stuck to her like glue. Perfect. Now, I listened to a podcast last night. David Nino Rodriguez. I listened to him a handful of times. Um, and he has a friend, Juan O'Savin. Juan O'Savin. Savin. And, um... They were talking about Sasquatch in this podcast. And apparently uh, David said that it's one of his favorite topics. And as I listened, I listened, he was really intent on listening to this man called Juan. And if you listen to it, um, you would also know that Juan isn't quite up to date on the knowledge when it comes to that topic. And David was really listening to him. So what I would propose is, actually, you know what? A couple of years ago, a lady got a hold of me. In an email, and she said that she was a friends with David Nino and wanted me to get him on his podcast or something. I'm like, hmm, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. I don't really do podcasts. People, I think people basically stop inviting me because I don't, I don't do them. Um, I've never tried to promote this place ever. You ever notice that? I don't try to promote this channel. Like, subscribe, share, share with all your friends. Get it out there. The odd time I get an important message and say, you know what, this one might be shareable. I think I said that twice now. <laughs> twice in 20,000 times. But anyway, I think this might be important because he has a substantial amount of people listening to him. And I believe after listening to him, David, if, he, if this is one of his favorite topics, and if he's going to have a podcast with this topic on it, I think I would like to hopefully maybe get to him first. Oh, anyway, sorry, backtrack. The lady got a hold of me and said she knows him and she's going to pass my phone number. I'm like, yeah? All right, not that that really do, does much anyway, because when I get strange numbers, I just ignore and delete. <laughs> so, anyway, 
I don't know what came of that. That was a couple years ago. But um, I'd like to get to him first in a way because he has such a following and he's enthusiastic and he wants knowledge, right? And what I would like to not see him do is go to one of the past typical so-called names, right? I believe Joe Rogan did that maybe once or twice. No. We need people who have a substantial audience who want to have true, honest knowledge. It's about time that the people take over that department, right? We can't have individuals who want to be called an expert spreading the absolute misinformation intentionally to large audiences, not anymore. This information has to come from all of you to all the people, right? <laughs> Take your mid tarsal break and ram it up your ass. So what I got to say to that one, okay? Anyway, so if you guys got a link to, I don't even know how to, how do you get a hold of people, right? How do you get a hold of people? I don't know. When they're busy and have a massive audience, they get tens of billions of emails. Because I know for a fact, obviously we know here, to go and email somebody who potentially gets shit piles of emails, it's like, um, you know, it's like throwing a, a note in a bottle and chuck it in the ocean. <laughs> right? Somebody might eventually get it. It's going to bob around for a while. So I guess if anybody out there has a, uh, a direct line to David, tell them that I'll do it. I will, uh, I'll fill him in. I'll fill him in with all the knowledge that came from all of you and make sure he gets on the right track if he wants to pursue this topic and if he wants to speak of it publicly to his audience. we got to make sure that he's loaded up with all the knowledge that you have all shared. How's that sound? I think that sounds good. Anyway, before, oh yeah, and I'll add in, before he gets wrangled into taking one of these people who want to be a celebrity and continue to mislead the masses. <laughs> there you go. There's my rat. Man, I want to go outside. I want to go outside and see the bears last night, today. But I'll tell you what, they just feel like shit. I can sit here and talk, but I, got, I, did, I finally did all my chainsaw work out there. Finally. I only have maybe an hour of splitting left, too. That's driving me nuts not doing that. But anyway, I couldn't even, uh, I couldn't even chop up my salmon and, and can yesterday. <laughs> so I had to throw some bags of ice on that in the cooler. I have to get that done today. Anyways, I'm rambling along. Let's get some voices heard. Some very, very important, vo some very, very important voices. And some factual first-hand knowledge from the people for the people. Let's get this going. All right, listen to this. This was titled, I Was Always a Skeptic. Hello, Steve. My name is Blake. I live in Northeast Alabama. I found your channel a few months back and have been watching your videos ever since. I admire your outlook on this topic and the way you view life in general. Thank you for the kind words, man. Like you, I have a great passion for the outdoors, hunting and fishing, etc. I'd be there 24-7 if it wasn't for this pesky thing called work getting in the way. I have the privilege of access to a large stretch of private land, and there is a three-acre lake that I frequently visit to catch bass. I have a side-by-side, -side, and I often get off of work and sneak up to the lake. I've always been a skeptic when it comes to Bigfoot, but there are events that take place a lot of times when I'm by myself fishing. It's a landlocked lake with massive hardwoods running around it. The terrain is somewhat rocky and mountainous. When I'm by myself fishing, I often hear a crunching of the leaves behind me. When I turn around, thinking to see some animal, I've never been able to see anything. The spot they like to fish doesn't have any tree growth over me, and yet oftentimes there are small rocks and pine cones that will be thrown in my direction to turn around and find nothing. I often just shake it off, even though I have the feeling of someone or something watching me. There's been several instances of unexplainable things, like I've seen lights in the woods around twilight sometimes. They look like a lantern or a flashlight, and I know for certain there's no one around. I've always wanted to camp out in this certain spot. It takes a serious off-road machine to get up to. Being the foothills of the Appalachian, I think it's probably the fourth highest peak in Alabama. Probably just an anthill compared to the mountains you have. At the top, you can see for miles. No shit! I wasn't aware of that, because I've always landed in Birmingham and then headed east to Tuscaloosa, and of course we go to Woods and Water, 
and then head farther east to my friend's place, and that's where we hang out along the... Oh, what's the name of that river? Tip of my tongue. So yeah, I've never seen any hills. Yeah, that's interesting that you have them there. But I've never gone that direction from the airport, right? At the top, you can see it for miles. So finally got with my brother-in-law, my young son, eight years old, and his son, Tom Bigby. Tom Bigby River? I think. <laughs> Sorry. I'm sick, okay? I got strep. I'm not thinking right. We loaded up and set up camp. Everything was normal. Now I'm going good. We had a fire started and we cooked some burgers over the fire. And that night, to our surprise, there was a beautiful full moon. It was absolutely spectacular. Being at the elevation we were, there was a light fog that was present that night. And as the fog rolled through the tall trees and the moon light illuminated, il illuminated it, it almost looked like headlights were coming up the mountain when there was absolutely no way any vehicle could make it to where we were. After the kids crawled in the tents, were fast asleep, my brother-in-law and I stepped away from the camp, so no more than 50 to 75 yards. We were standing there, sipping on a cold one, admiring the moon, and the way it illuminated the fog. There's a bit of missing a lot of punctuation, okay, you guys? I picked up a large rock, probably the size of a softball, and thought, and threw it at a tree, making a loud smack, just for fun, startling my brother-in-law. Ten seconds after that, off to our right, there was a loud smack that sounded exactly like the sound I just made. We looked at each other and I said, Man, did you hear that? He said, I did. At that moment, I remembered that Bigfoot does the exact same thing with tree knocks. What else could have imitated that sound? I got the chills and did not proceed to knock on any more trees. We headed back to the fire, not interested in provoking anything else. 30 to 45 minutes have passed, and we pretty much had forgotten about the incident. It was pretty quiet, only our conversation and the crackling of the fire went from behind us, coming up a steep hill, was a, what I would describe as a herd of animals running straight towards us and making huffing noises. Could have been deer, I said, but I've never heard any animal make that noise. We had the fire going. He quickly stood up and shined the flashlight in that direction. To no surprise, seeing nothing. We both had our sidearms on our hips, so I felt that I felt I had some security. Otherwise, I was ready to wake the kids and get out of there. Still not seeing anything. I can't say for certain what is up there. I just have that feeling. Nevertheless, we stayed the night. There was no more activity. Later that week, I just asked one of the old timers that had lived on this land for his whole life and he had stories of his own that he was reluctant to tell and saying he knows some of the other neighbors that have had some goings on as well so all in all this is my encounter still not sure without seeing but some things are just hard to explain i have another experience that i'm interested in knowing if you or your viewers have ever experienced something like this i'll keep it short i'm 35 now i was 13 when this happened I lived in White Plains, Alabama. We had some property that was about a half a mile walk through a cornfield on a wood line to get to our camping spot next to a Chocaloco Choc Choc Creek. Chocaloco Creek. <laughs> Don't you guys love it when I butcher words? It was me and two of my buddies. We got to the spot, we set up our tent, and it had gotten dark. Looking back now, we didn't have our priorities straight and we were more interested in in setting the limb hooks for catfish than starting the fire as we were setting limb hooks there was a sound like something smacking the water over and over we said it must be a bee oops freaking mosquito sorry so it must be a beaver slapping his tail in the water although i've never heard that before a few moments after that, one of the most terrifying noises I've ever heard in the dark was the sound of a large hog screaming and rushing right at us. Not having any light we couldn't see, we made a beeline to the tent. The smallest of my buddies got to the tent first, and I thought he was in the tent, but he couldn't get the zipper open and was crawling under. 
So in my panic, I burst through thinking the tent was open and I ripped it to shreds. My other buddy let out a scream and the noise stopped. We stayed in the tent, or what was left of it. Collecting our thoughts and being young and unarmed, we decided that we would grab some large sticks and make our way back to the house, leaving everything behind. Thinking back now, there was a putrid, wet dog, dead fish smell when we had first got there. I wonder if that was a Bigfoot charge, sounding like what our young ears interpreted as a hog. Anyways, it's good to have a place to get some of this off your chest and to hear that other people have similar accounts. Thanks for what you do, your fellow adorsman Blake. Blake, appreciate you, man. You're a brave free man coming forward. It just made me laugh. I'm not trying to be insulting. I'm just picturing a couple of young guys bolting, shitting themselves, running for the tent, the nylon, <laughs> to, uh, to stop a charging hog. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny, isn't it? It's funny how we as humans, how we react naturally. It's kind of funny, right? I mean, what? How? How? And why do our brains actually think that a tent is safe and is some kind of a magical barrier to stop any kind of a, a predator from shredding the shit out of us? Isn't that kind of funny? Isn't that funny? And when in reality, the last thing you're going to do is try to dive into a, uh, a nylon casket, <laughs> right, with something hot on your ass. But anyway, yeah, you know what it was. You know what it was, Blake. You know what it was, man. That's all I can say, that you know what it was. All right, here we go, what's this? You're still hanging here, man, and you've learned anything else. Make sure you get it to us if it's important, all right? If you think it's important. This is titled, We're in a Small Bunkhouse. Hello, Steve, this will be the third time I am contacting you. This time I was out with my uncle. We have a little 10 by 20 bunkhouse where he stays. I was hanging out down there with him when I went to head up to my house, just up the hill, when I heard a huge snap from the woods behind the house. A ways after, I heard footsteps from around the area. And then a little closer to me on the other side of my pond, I heard another set of steps going towards the snap. It sounded like it was on two feet and fairly heavy. I believe I heard twigs snapping, as if it was snapping them as it stepped through the snow, or it was brushing them with its shoulders, which would have to be huge if it was in a tall pine forest. Which, huge, it was in a tall pine forest. Experience two. Oh, that hurts to swallow. This was years ago with one of my friends. I'm 13 now. I was probably seven or eight then. But we were making forts in the woods behind the house. I almost said farts. We're making forts in the woods behind the house right where I heard the snap. I heard the snap last night just for context. But where we were making first, because no punctuation at all. None. Let me do that again. Right where I heard the snap, I heard the snap last night. Just for context. But wait. Where we're making first out of sticks? We heard this sound, a whoop or howl or something. It scared us so bad. We dropped a crowbar we had been using and ran into the house. When we got inside, we researched wolf howls and koi wolf and coyote howls, but nothing matched. I haven't heard anything like it to this day. And only a little while ago, I could put two and two together. And one of the many weird things is... I haven't found any tracks or anything, but my friend and I were too scared after the howl to go, look, my name is Isaiah Cosgrove. You can use my name. I live near Traverse City, Michigan. Thank you for all you have been doing. It helps a lot of people. So it goes on here, though. Steve, sir, if you can't tell from earlier, my emails aren't sending right. I have another message for you about children's sixth sense. I'm in the seventh grade, and it may, way be well, it may well be rubbed out of me. I've been feeling things like a sixth sense, but also like the feeling these things do 
they, if it is them, have done it to me before. But only after I started watching shows about them, which are the fake trash one, but still made me believe. But after I saw them, I started getting feelings telling me not to go places. I clearly wish I had a dog. I believe it would help me a lot. But building on the heating, they do it but I don't know what they are guarding unless they just don't want me to see them. Because sometimes I can go places, sometimes I can't hunt a spot between a cornfield and a thicket where deer like to bed down, and sometimes they tell me I shouldn't be here. But I can't just walk out of my blind and leave. Sometimes I wish I could, but I don't think the fear is as bad as the people say for me. It is still fairly paralyzing, but it isn't as strong as I've had this before. But when something happened, a deer walked out, but this is in my backyard, and this was when I was young, before I knew of these beings. I wonder if it was them warning me about it, and helping me stay still. I'm sorry for such a long email. You don't have to read it. All. Oh, I don't care if you use my name. If you do, read this in a video. I haven't heard anything like this, and I think it could help clarify for some of the people, but a lot of this doesn't add up. I think I've finally found your email. Since watching your channel, I learn more and more each video. It is amazing. I've never seen one of these, but I have heard the howls and have been told, don't go there. And I have felt like I've been being watched and I've felt the leave now. I hate when I get this, especially in my blind, because I can't leave without being asked by my parents. And I don't want to explain. But next year I go hunting, I'm not going to go alone. Thank you for all you do. Sorry for the terrible spelling and punctuation. I had to do all these fast. Okay, got you, man. No problem. It's no problem at all. Got her. Yeah, it sounds like you're frustrated. And then you want some answers. Um, the answers are all here through the voices of these people, right? You know, you're here right alongside me listening and learning. You're going to have to keep listening to the people here. Take from it what you will, my man. And, um... Every single thing that you mentioned in your email has been covered by somebody here numerous times, all right? So, I'm just saying that um, as long as you keep listening to the people here, you're going to see the patterns. You're going to see what people witnessed, experienced, what happened to them, or didn't happen to them, right? And then you'll be able to conduct yourself accordingly, fairly accurately from, from gaining the knowledge from the people, right? Gaining knowledge from the people. If you're worried about what your parents, what they think, send them a video from this channel and ask them to listen to it. Because you're not alone. Nobody's alone anymore. Not here. Thanks for sending that in, man. Keep me posted and updated. Don't quit what you'd love to do, alright? Don't quit. It's titled Colorado Camping. Hey Steve, my name is Josh from a small town in Colorado. My experience, says, wasn't really exciting as much as an encounter. My family and friends went up into the mountains, Pike National Forest, to play around. We're camping, sharing a tent, with about seven of us inside. <laughs> I have no idea of the time, but I guess about 1 a.m. or so. I'm a very heavy sleeper, but I trust my sixth sense explicitly. The world just went quiet which is what woke me up. I opened my eyes and listened intently. I started looking around in a groggy state and looked up to the top of our 10-man tent and couldn't see anything. My eyes wandering around the tent and my friends, all of them were currently passed out. I want to pause for a sec to clarify. My dad was army and has always taught me to be honest, be confident in what you say you are do, and above everything, trust your gut. Beautiful. That being said, this is the first time I've ever said this to anyone. I was around 14 or so in high school and was a hefty big boy and have, spent, and have pretty big hands. As I lay there waiting and listening to the sounds around me, I hear a twig snap on the ground behind us. As I snap my head towards that sound, I saw this huge shadow of a hand, and I mean huge hand, dragging along our tent wall. I put my hand close to it at the time. Close to it at the time, I wore a size large gloves, and it was easily double that size. <laughs> Pick up 
Picture that, you guys. Picture that going down. I looked around, my friend's still asleep. It started circling the tent, dragging its hand along. As it got over my head, I did something stupid. I reached up and smacked the hand. There was a soft, surprised grunt. I could feel the stunned feeling, and then the soft, heavy sounds moving away from the tent. I went back to sleep and got up the next morning, looked around, and saw nothing. I asked my dad, as he was the only one bigger than me present, if he had got up to pee during the night. He responded, No, your sister was sound asleep all night and I didn't want to wake her. She was recovering from an ear infection. He asked why, and I didn't answer. I just said I was curious. My gut told me it meant no harm, but the size still amazes me. Anyways, I know I've rambled on. I've never shared this with anyone before. I wasn't quite, quite sure what to make of it. The place it happened, I grew up dirt biking all the time. Felt, felt like being watched a couple of times, but your channel has convinced me to come forward to share. Thanks for all you do. God bless. Feel free to use my name. Thanks for your time. Okay, man. Appreciate your time, Josh. That must have been something else. And you know what? From your dad's background, the way he carries himself, I'm guessing. If you drop what you witnessed on him, he's going to maybe possibly have something to add to it. All right? Not from that night, but from another time or one of his friends or his career, whatever. That's what I'm guessing. You should try it. If you're a little too nervous, send him this video first. Warm him up. All right, who's next? This title Vancouver Island. All right, where we are today, right here. Hello, Steve. I've been following your post for several years now and have no idea. And you have no idea how much it's helped me out. I've written you before, passed on a short story about a photograph and meetings I had with the late Dr. John Bendernagel. Wish I had met up with John years ago. He was a good man. He was a good man. Steve, I'm on, I am an island man. I grew up in Victoria, and like you, I was into slingshots, bows, and air rifles from the time I was eight years old. Thanks to my late father, who moved the family from the prairies to the island in 1947, I, like you, got to enjoy a bit of paradise. we got another dog coming in. My father, like your grandfather, fought in the World War II. He signed up with the SSR, South Saskatchewan Regiment, two months before his 18th birthday. Dad would never talk about the war, and the only time I remember seeing my father cry was the day he handed me an 8-track video he had ordered called The Beaches of Normandy. I plugged that video in and no sooner started when I turned to see tears in Dad's eyes. He turned and walked out of the room. P.S. He did tell me the boys referred to SSR as shoot, shit, and run. When I was around 12 years old, I pleaded with my dad to take me fishing. So we started out by renting a boat from Oak Bay Marina. That started a lifetime of love, of fishing, for both of us. When I pleaded to go hunting, Dad stepped up, and every Sunday morning at 5 a.m., he would take me to the woods. I soon realized Dad was not thrilled to be back around guns again, but he understood my passion. Steve, I hunted and fished pretty near every spot you could find, from Humpback Road to Souk, Leechtown to Couch and Lake, and beyond. When I was 17, I should have drowned in the San Juan River when I was swept off my feet and into a large log brush pile, but that's another story. I'm almost reading my own story. That happened to me, too. We flipped a canoe in the San Juan and got slammed into a frickin' log pile in the corner. This is kind of a weird email for me to read. Because I'm like checking everything off. Yep, 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 me too. Weird. Thing is, Steve, I'm soon to hit my 75th birthday, and I have spent countless hours in the backcountry. I've hunted moose, elk, deer all over BC. I faced a grizzly who wanted my moose, and I've shot a large black bear from the hip as it came over at me over a rock face. I could still feel it brush my legs as it passed and then drop 40 feet away. Steve, here's the thing I have no fear in the woods, never have. My idea of feeling close to God comes when I'm standing in the timber and alone. My wife and I still head into the backcountry in our small motorhome, preferring the remote lakes in the Nimpkish Valley to any public parks. 
Side note, there's a lady there who was videotaping a big boar grizzly in her yard a couple weeks ago. Seen it. There's a fair amount of grizzlies up there on the island now. Swimming across from mainland BC. Here's where you and your readers have helped me cope with a never-ending question that has me awake and up before daylight pretty much every morning. I know about Sasquatch. And here's a quick rundown of my experiences. Number one. When I was 15 and hunting in Souk, I came across a game trail at first light, and laying in the middle of the trail was a fresh, human-like turd, 14 to 15 inches long, 2 inches in diameter, and brown in color. I thought it was another hunter who just messed up my hunt and never did even. And he never even wiped his butt. I think different now. Number two. I got to view a clear Polaroid picture back in 76 that clearly showed a tall Sasquatch walking through, the, through some aspen trees on a sunny day. The pitch was so clear, I could see dark patch under its right arm that I'm sure was sweat. The hair was not long, and in fact I compared it in length and color to a deer. I estimated height at around 7 feet using trees as a guide. It also looked to be, in my opinion, around late teens in human years. How's that for an interesting point made? How many people can look at some kind of monkey or gorilla and say the same? Nobody. I came close to arranging a meeting with John Bindernagel and the owner of that picture, but John passed. And Norm, the owner of it, passed three weeks after John, so not to be. I've had other experiences, but what drives me nuts is my reaction to what happened in 2018. It was early April, and my wife and I were heading for Oshinaw Lake up in Strathcona Park. Strathcona Park, that's where Dr. John heard uh, screams there and also found tracks. We were accessing the park from above Great Central Lake and up the Ash Main, which is right over here. <laughs> As the crow flies, not too far. I could get to there in about uh, 15 minutes. I made it well into the park, but got stopped by a large snowpack that still blocked the road. I was dressed in casual clothes, but hiked up the hill anyways, looking for tracks of deer or whatever. What I found were eight pristine footprints crossing the road. The snow was half ice, half snow, so packed tight. The prints were so clear, I could make out what looked like a two-inch gouge in its right heel. It showed in four tracks. The detail in those tracks was astonishingly clear, and I cursed myself for not having casting material, as I believe those have been, would have been some of the clearest tracks on record. Steve, what really bothers me and inspired me to write this long, rambling letter is this. I studied these tracks, and three times I walked back to my truck and tried to get my wife to come look at them, and she would not. I looked at those in wonder, trying to turn them into fakes, but just not possible for a man to fake those. They were too clear, too large, and too deep in the snow. As well as too far apart for any man I have ever met. Also, ours were only... Ours were the only vehicle tracks on the road. What I can't explain is the mind games that were just totally out of character for me. I talked myself out of taking pictures. I told myself they would not turn out as set in snow. And I convinced myself no one would believe me anyway, so I walked away. Wow. That's, that's crazy. Instead of parking for the night, we drove back to Elsie Lake and spent three days looking at other campers' leftover trash. It's funny, I almost made it to Elsie Lake taking you guys up that road last year. Lots of stuff is going on at Elsie Lake. Steve, it eats at my brain. I just can't get my head around walking away from one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. It's like I had brain fog and totally out of character. Same for my wife not to want to leave the truck. I just can't explain it. Those tracks were fresh, very fresh, and headed towards the Ash River. That was maybe 30 yards away. This letter's way too long and I may not even send it, but here's a footnote. I know a family whose name is known worldwide, so I won't mention it. I have a great respect for these folks, so was reluctant to tell them this story. I should not 
I, sh I should not have been for, as it turned out, the wife of my friend swears. She saw a Sasquatch in a slash three weeks after my experience and swears it was not a bear. Same area. One last thing. I have the image of that Polaroid picture from the 70s burned into my brain to this day. I really wanted John to see that photo. As he told me, he thought it was to be Gigantopithecus, an ape. Yeah, the poor dude. My response was, no, it looked too human. I think that disappointed him. I've since found a picture on the web, a sketch, that is as close as it gets, and if John were still around, I would drive to Courtney to say, John, this is what at least one of them looks like. Since spotting those tracks, we've had several other experiences. Number one, we're camped at a small lake on, on February 26th, my wife's birthday. She got up from the fire, walked over towards me, and with a big smile says, I'm going to call to Sasquatch. Might have been the two glasses of wine. Well, she let out a whoop, and immediately, out of the timber, 50 yards away, came a response you could feel in your chest. The look on her face was priceless. No doubt. I grabbed a camera and took off into the timber, but saw nothing. April 2020, we camped at a large lake that was joined to a small lake by a short river. We had a First Nations man who was researching the area approach our camp and asked me not to go down to the river as there were Sasquatch in the area and if I did see them, to not to throw rocks or bother them, just leave the area. I don't know of anybody that would throw a rock at something with that description, do you? The next day, my wife and I walked up the road a short distance, and she waited while I went to check a trail cam I set up by the lake in hopes of catching a cow and calf elk that was tracking up the area. I was gone maybe 10 minutes, and on returning, found my wife was halfway back to the camper. She was a bit shaken. I explained she felt stomach sick from what she thought was a dead animal rotting in the bush. Actually, she described it as smelling like rotting meat and strong B.O. Bush was thick, but the smell was gone, and no sign of anything. I searched the area well. Steve, I envy you for your time. I envy you, your time in the high timber. Thank you so much for your work. If you, if you have never fished Nootka Sound or been to Critter Cove, it's worth the trip. Do what you will this letter. I'm long past worrying what others think, and like my father taught me, don't lie to people, and if you shake a man's hand, you stick to your word. Best regards, Ken Salmond. If you're ever in Parksville, love to sit down and talk hunting stories. Did I? S I've heard from you, Ken. Did I share this one? I don't remember sharing this one. Is there any way you can find that Polaroid? I mean, it's so funny. Now that's the, that's the second, almost firsthand, close enough for me to pursue account of a Polaroid, a clear Polaroid. I had that guy who used to live where I was living near Pemberton, knew a man. I mean, we ac we accurately tracked down the man, tracked down where his old trailer was, it was still there, tracked down a relative. And Jeff, remember Jeff sat around the fire with me. Jeff, I think, spoke to this man who was related to the man who passed away, who had the Polaroid, who was bringing food to these bush people all the time. And from the way the original guy who contacted me described it, because he saw the photos, and he ran into these beings all the time as the crow flies 20 clicks, maybe 40 clicks from where the food is being left from the other guy. And he said, those weren't the same ones I was seeing from the looks of the faces in that picture. <laughs> How crazy is that? Right? This guy who's seen these things in his face numerous times, just said matter of factly, yeah, the ones I saw in the Polaroid, they weren't the ones that I was seeing. Anyway, the Polaroids are gone. They're gone. It kind of sucks, right? Because I really thought we were going to get a hold of those. But anyway, if you could, Ken, is there any way you could track down those Polaroids? I mean, the man passed away, but he's got to have some family, right? I wonder if that would be a, a reality, maybe. And it would be interesting to hear where you're hunting in Souk, because when I was a boy, and my mom and the drunken scumbag finally left our home when I was 
trying to kill him with a hockey stick because he was, I thought he was going to kill my sister. And then, um, after that, we had to go out there and stay out there every second weekend or whatever. I had to go to Souk and stay there. And there was a, I guess he had an old recurve bow sitting there. He tried to fit in with these guys at work who were into archery. And he never, he never picked it up. This bow was sitting there. So I grabbed that bow and I would just go off into the woods alone. <laughs> That's how I started hunting. Nobody hunted in my family. And uh, I said, I didn't want to be in that house, right? This is drunken frickin' scumbag sitting there drinking vodka, watching golf and sports. And uh, one of the most evil people in the world. But anyway, aside from that, what I'm getting at is, I'm going to give you whoever's here that's familiar with the area. Now listen to this. I was coming into Souk. Edward Milne High School would be on the right-hand side of the highway heading west, right? Now, if you get... I don't know what it's like around there now. I've been there for years. It's probably changed up, but I'm sure the power lines are still there. And when you look over top of the high school from the highway up at the back, the base of that mountain, hill, I think it's a hill, it's a mountain, there's power lines that come down from Harbor View Road, right? Harbor View Road was that logger road access, but back at the casinos. Anyway, those power lines came from Harvey Road all the way down the side of the mountain, and then they would dog leg, dog leg right to go towards the potholes, Souk River. So right on that corner, right on that moss-covered face, right up top there, that is where I shot my very first deer ever with a bow and arrow when I was like 13 or something. And it was a great big four-point. Crazy, right? I got it right there on top of that moss face. Anyway. I would hike up there from the top of, uh, I'm sure it's called a still Lannan Creek Trailer Park. And I would make my mom set the alarm for like four in the morning. I didn't even have hiking boots, I had runners, a red plaid shirt, didn't have any hunting clothes. And the second I got there, I'd have to ride out there with the dirt bag from Victoria, when I got out of school, he'd pick me up, because my mom would all be at the souk, and you know that scumbag, he'd have, he'd, have a, he'd have a Mickey of vodka and a six pack of beer just for the drive home. And the second I'd just sit there, and the second we got to my mom's, I'd go in the house, grab the bow, whoosh, I'm gone. <laughs> so where I would go, I would go to the top of that trailer park, which bordered that power line actually came down right at the top of, they had some land there where they had soil piled up and there's land and creek was right there. And I would put a, I remember I'd get four sticks and I'd push them into the soil pile and that would be my bullseye to practice with the bow and I'd stand there and shoot the bow. But anyway, the thick bush was right there. The power lines went up towards Harvey Road and I remember back then feeling like something was watching me from the thick bushes up at the head of that Atlantic Creek. Always. I never went in there. And that's when I was like 13. Never went in there. And I always felt it. I'd go, I'd shoot my bow. I'm shooting this way, the creek, the bush, the hardwoods are that way. I'd shoot my bow and I'd be kind of glancing over there and I'd go and I'd pull my arrows out and I'd walk back and I'd be glancing over. I'll never forget that. And then I would set, get my mom to set the alarm for 4 or 4.30 in the morning and off I would go. And I'd go up across the creek, or right at the foot of those thick bushes. And then I'd head up the top of the power line heading towards that moss bluff. But I would never go that way. Ever. I never went to the high side of those power lines towards that hill. Ever. Because it felt, it didn't feel good. I felt pressure back then. I could feel the pressure. I never forgot that. Still to this day. And then... A handful of years later, I met a woman who saw up Harborview Road. There's a couple, was it Glintz Lake? There's a couple different lakes up there. And I remember meeting a woman who said they heard something running over and they said there's a man in a fur, fur coat bolting through the timber right there. And you mentioned Humpback Road, Humpback Road. There's a female RCMP who watched three of them cross the road in front of her. I know four fisheries officers who are driving a humpback road trying to get back to Souk after drinking in Victoria, taking the big roundabout that everybody would do to avoid going through Colwood and getting pinched by the cops. And they were going through humpback road and that thing crossed from the, what would have been the south side of humpback, crossed in front of the headlights and disappeared in the darkness on the right. And I'll never forget the look on his face when he told me. And the first thing he said was, we were scared to turn around. And that little point right there, 
solidified he was he was being straight up because you know humpback road is just a single wide road dips and winds full dark rainforest growing over the top is creepier than shit in there and imagine seeing a 10 foot tall freaking hair thing run across the road in front of your headlights you gotta stop and you're gonna have to do like five or six point turnaround next thing you know there's no lights behind you but that thing's behind you right so it makes sense to say we were scared to turn around and that happened in humpback road i also years ago heard a rumor of somebody in suit told me that they heard of a guy who was hunting and shot himself because he was being chased by a sasquatch he couldn't handle it i remember hearing that back then but yeah since then there's all sorts of shits going on in suit past suit but renters on fire the whole island's on fire right the malahat is still to this day a hot activity spot and if you are familiar with there the power lines that go from the malahat across the sandwich peninsula the second set of power lines going towards Duncan. You pull over there and look across to the right, where they join on land at the top, near, on the right-hand side. That's where I had my experience, right there. Right there. And as well, straight down below Hall's Boathouse is where recently some people were on in their boat at nighttime and using their spotlight, and there was two or three of them in the water. And as soon as the, the spotlight hit them, they were clinging to the rock, and they froze, thinking that they were blending in. And these people clearly saw it from the boat. Yeah, it's endless, right? It's endless. But anyway, yeah, no doubt we've uh, hunted a lot of the same area for sure. I used to as well, I'd walk on the, there's an old concrete water line used years ago going from the reservoir on Humpback Road all the way to Souk. And I used to hike up to it from behind the 17 mile pub. I'd park on the top of the highway. There's an old chunk of highway grown in. I'd walk in there all the way to the back. And there was an old, ancient, single pole, single line, old remnants of a power line coming down. I'd hang a right and walk up that, and then I'd hit that old concrete uh, water pipe. What is that thing? Three feet around? Thick? And I would walk on top of it even further back into that big old mature fur. And then I'd hunt back in there. And I got some big deer in there. And it's funny, I wonder if I would have went in there then if I knew what was going on. Because there's that's a bit of a hot spot there too, right? Anyway, that's a bit of a ramble. Wow, I guess hearing your description kicked in all those memories for me. Anyway, I better get going. Sarah's going to probably blow a gasket on me because I haven't gone to the clinic. Apparently, you have to get to the clinic early so I can get some antibiotics and get this shit out of me. I'm not feeling quite as cloudy. I'm feeling pretty shitty, but not as shitty as yesterday. Now, back at it. Uh, yeah, she's got a whole bunch of new hats, and she actually made a whole bunch of cool shirts for the ladies. She's been pretty excited about it. It's pretty cool to watch her be excited and do this. So um, I'll help her later on. i got to get my fish done. Blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm rambling. I'm rambling. David Nino Rodriguez. Guez. David Nino, Ro David Nino Rodriguez. Um, you guys got a direct line to him or know how to get a hold of him? I'll do it. I would prefer to be one of the first to get to him so that I can share all of your knowledge with him so he doesn't get on the wrong track and then pass on the wrong track to his audience, right? That's what's concerning for me. Also, what would I need to do whatever they do? I've, I've got one of those web cameras. I bought it brand new. And I have a stand-up microphone that plugs into the laptop. I think that's what all these people use, isn't it? Because I use my camera, an SD card, and then I load it under the editing program. So I think I'm set up. I just have to get a little coaching on how to how to do it. But if you guys know how to get a hold of them, let them know that I'm I'm down with uh, sharing some true knowledge with them to keep them on the right track, so he doesn't spread the misinformation and get sucked into talking to one of those phony sons of bitches, right? Now share my story at howtohunt.com. That's where you get to share it. A lot of people claim to not being able to get their emails to me. I don't know why. Or they don't go through or something. I don't know. Share my story at howtohunt.com. That is where you get your true first-hand knowledge shared word for word. There you go. Here I go. Starve another day.